Welcome to Cocktails in the War Room. Every night at 8.30, we meet right here in my war room to hang out for the day, decompress, celebrate the fact that we made it through another day, and basically just try to support each other through the craziest year that has ever been. So I'm Mistress Carrie. Thank you very much for hanging out. Cocktails in the war room. What's going on, Monica? What's going on, Beth? Hey. What's going on, Kitty? Hey, Drea. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Stephanie. Oh, I got some crazy flyaway hair going on again today. I just put my hoodie on because I got a little cold and now I'm like staticky craziness. What's up, Elsa? Hey, Ash, Dave. What's up, Bish? Hey, Erica. Hey, Rob. Hello. Dave says, Andrew Strong, GS 2020. Hey, Tate. What's going on, Kim? Hey, Scruffy. So as you guys may have noticed in the description of this video, uh, I think we all need to have new names. Now, somebody commented last night asking me how to pronounce Elon Musk's son's name. And at the time, I had not seen the news to see that Elon Musk and his girlfriend named their newborn son XAEA12 Musk. They haven't said how they're pronouncing it exactly, but the name uh, X is the unknown variable. The AE that's built together is the Elvin AI, which is for love or artificial intelligence. Um, A12 is to represent the SR-71, which is their favorite aircraft, which is a no weapons aircraft that is just extremely fast and streamlined. And then of course, Musk, which is Elon Musk's last name. So I decided that if that's what they're going to name their son, that maybe I should change my name to XMCA10. X, the unknown variable, MC for Mistress Carrie, and A10 because of the friggin' warthogs because they are my favorite aircraft. So there you go. Maybe we all need to come up with our new names. What's up, Sean? So maybe in the comments you guys could tell me what your new names are because I don't understand, maybe I'm just not smart enough to understand Elon Musk's son's name. I mean, Elon Musk did invent the Tesla. He did invent rockets that not only launch, but then land again. I mean, there's no doubt the man's a genius. I'm just saying that when you're that rich and you're that crazy, they don't call you crazy, they call you eccentric. So Elon Musk is very eccentric. Thank you, Karina, love my hoodie. This is gonna serve as my concert shirt tonight because I'm cold. So I had the windows open pretty much all day, um, but it was a gift from Vinnie Paul, my hell yeah shirt, so, uh, or my sweatshirt, I should say, the hoodie. Um, and I love it and it's super comfortable. So it means more because, oh, it's got a weird point on the hood there. Uh, it means more because Vinnie Paul gave it to me. So at least I'm nice and warm. What's the formula again? XAEA12 Musk. But it's not AE, it's the symbol that's A, and then the E is made out of one of the lines of the A. Like it's on scientific calculators. I'm not smart enough to know if they pronounce it something different. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't understand. I renamed myself Horatio Helpop. <laughs> uh, Jared says my nickname has been Mongo for a long time. So I guess if we all get to name ourselves something, something a little bit straight. Jennifer says uh, XJSF16. So there you go. Uh, speaking of uh, our favorite planes, did you guys see the F-15s today? The eagles that were flying. Heinz says XHS S69. I figured there were going to be a bunch of 69s in there from you guys. Um, did you guys see the jets? Oh, I told you the story about my flight. It just, 
Those jets are like my favorite thing. Ugh. Did I tell you guys the other part of the story um, about my orientation flight in the F-15? Because I don't think I told you this part of the story. I showed you guys the flight plotter, um, which they do for every flight, um, the same way that they did today. They plot it out. Uh, Ian says, XIDSR71. Yeah, because that's their favorite plane too, SR75. My name is Mud15, <laughs> or Mud F15, I should say. Like Tool Anima, says Ron. Yes, it's the A with the E, like Tools Anima. Exactly. Thank you for the clarification. I just don't know if you're supposed to pronounce it something else. Uh, Paula says the F15s flew right over my house. Yes, it was so cool, says Mariah. On, uh, Stacy says on Twitter, someone replied to him guessing Ash Archangel as a translation and he liked the tweet. I don't know what to tell you. Don says when you passed out, yes. So I passed out when I was in the F-15s. Look, I went 680 miles an hour in 9Gs and I passed out. That's what happens. But I don't know if I told you guys about my call sign. I can't, I don't think I told you guys that. So after I went on my flight, um, obviously they were all making fun of me because they got me to pass out. And I was making fun of them because uh, they said they were going to make me puke and I have an iron stomach, so they didn't make me puke. So I went back a couple months later. Um, they had like an Oktoberfest on the, on the base. Um, like one drill weekend. And so they invited me to come back and um, I had been joking with my pilot, Wad, that I wanted to have um, a cool name like he had. And he was like, well, you have Mistress Carrie. And I was like, yeah, but that's what they call me on the radio. Like I'm a fighter pilot now because I have one hour of flight time and I want a cool name too. So all of the pilots from the 104th Fighter Wing got together in the officers club and this is when I learned how fighter pilots get their call signs. Normally, from what I was told, they get their call signs for something that they screwed up or some kind of an inside joke that happens during training. So, you know, I met guys that were named Rooster and, you know, I mean, you've seen Top Gun. They all have these, you know, Iceman, Maverick, Goose, all of that stuff. So anyway, they gathered all of the pilots in the officer's club and um, they had a big dry erase board up on the wall. And so everyone, so it was all pilots and me, and they started yelling out um, names that I could get. Two hands carry. I know, right? Yay! Two hands. So they started yelling out possible call sign names for me. And it was like rocker and this and that. I mean, there was just every purple. There were all of these things. So then someone yelled clam because they were trying to find something that was derogatory for women. And Mistress Cobbler, I know it was before the Blueberry Cobbler or I would have made the suggestion. So somebody yelled clam. And I was like, are you guys kidding me? I am not going to have you guys call me clam for the rest of my life. So that's when I was told that you could drink a name off of the board if you did a shot. So I was like, bartender, Garcone, shots please. So I took a shot and said, I want to drink clam off the board because I don't want to be called clam for the rest of my life by you guys. So I did the shot. They wiped clam off the board. And then one of those bastards in the back of the room said, I want to drink clam back on the board. And they gave him a shot and they did it and they wrote clam back on the board, which I could not believe that you could drink it back on. And they were like, do you want to drink it off the board again? I was like, no, I'm not stupid. There's 50 of you and one of me. My liver is never going to recover from that. So they whittle it down and people are like, I don't like this one or I don't like that one. And they get it down to about five. 
and I don't remember what the rest of them were other than clam and what ended up being my call sign. And there were a few more. And I voiced my displeasure at clam for obvious reasons. And then they kick the person out of the room that's getting named, which is a very scary thing. It's like you're waiting for the jury to come back outside the room. And so they made me sweat it out for a while. And then they brought me back in and then they started erasing names off the board. And finally there were two left and they erased Clam off the board, which I was so happy that Clam got taken off the board. So my official Air Force call sign is Narco, N-A-R-K-O. And the explanation behind that is I'm narcoleptic because I fall asleep when I'm not supposed to, i.e. passing out in the plane from 680 miles an hour in 9 Gs, but they spelled it N-A-R-K-O because they wanted it to be more rock and roll, like corn. So they re-spelled it, and so my official Air Force call sign for my flight with the 104th Fighter Wing of the Mass Air National Guard is in fact narco, N-A-R-K-O, which is um, what they call me when I see them and we get together. And uh, so I love my call sign. I had it in the signature of my AAF email for years and record company people or whoever would uh, email me back and be like, what's up with the, it would say call sign narco. And they'd be like, what is up with the narco thing? And I'd be like, uh, I'm a fighter pilot. I've got one hour of flight time. I'm officially a fighter pilot. I have one more hour than you. So I have narco for life, says Aaron. Exactly. Um, Shane says, that is fucking awesome. Ash says, narco, badass, love it. Yeah, I way better than clam, says Mariah. Uh, so I thought it was really cool. And it meant the world to me that the guys were so welcoming and and... You know, with all of the stories that I've told you guys in the war room over the last 54 days, this is number 54, which is crazy, um, there's one common thread amongst all of the different um, things that I've done with different branches of the military, and that I'm usually, not always, but usually the only girl, and I'm usually the only civilian around. And... Um, I can't say enough amazing things about all of the different branches of the military, um, all of the different units. Just, I have never once in all of the time I have spent either overseas with our troops or here at home, uh, whether they are on duty or off duty, I have always been treated like one of the guys, but been treated with the utmost respect and been so welcomed into their family and really treated like like one of them. And I can't tell you how much that means to me and what a blessing it is for me to have all of these amazing stories, to be able to tell them back to you, but to feel like I'm a little part of that brotherhood. Obviously, I'm very well aware that I am a civilian and that I've never served in uniform. But the way that, that these guys have always made me feel like I belonged, like I was part of the group, um, it's been a real honor in my life to have been um, treated and welcomed that way. And so I always, um, you know, really want to make sure when I tell these stories that the amount of respect and love that I have for being welcomed into this community, and uh, I consider them my family right back. And... You know, there's a lot of my guys that meet up with us in the war room every night. And, you know, I know that Joe, my producer in Iraq, and Mike, my producer in Afghanistan, and, you know, all of the, the radio station staff that's ever gone out on any of these military things with me. Um, our promotions coordinator, uh, Lindsay, was there the day that I um, flew in the jet. And she was on the ground when we went whizzing by her. And she was like, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. And when I flew with John Klatt in the, um, the trick plane, um, 
there's a video up on the AAF YouTube of me flying in the, uh, the 300 Extra, the little trick plane with the Air National Guard. And Raz, our old, um, Raz Mig, our old video guy, they put him in a harness and put him in the chase plane. And this is the AAF video guy hanging out of a flying aircraft, getting video of me doing all of these somersaults. And we landed, he was like, is this the kind of shit you guys do all the time? This is unbelievable. So everybody from the radio station that ever went along with me on any of these crazy adventures, um, you know, just always comes back and is like, if this is what it's like when you're around these guys all the time, that is just amazing. I, I want to do this with you all the time. So um, to all of my uh, 104th Fighter Wing friends, uh, all the barnstormers, you guys made Massachusetts proud today, uh, flying over the um, 85th recruiting troop from the Massachusetts State Police who uh, graduated today at Gillette Stadium. They did the graduation ceremony on the field at Gillette, social distancing, everyone wearing masks, but congratulations to the 240 new Massachusetts State Troopers that are literally get going from the, uh, what's the saying, from the frying pan into the fire. Uh, nothing like getting activated as a new trooper in the middle of a global pandemic. So thank you to all of them, but um, the Jets made a lot of people happy today and to pay tribute to all of the healthcare workers on International Nurses Day is pretty awesome. So the first people that we have to toast today, and you guys gotta see the rig I got set up for my cocktail tonight. Look at this shit, Woo! So this is the last of my Fernandez Sangria. I cleaned out a drawer in my kitchen and uh, because I'm a zombie prepper, I can things. And somebody for Christmas last year and my family bought me all of these cool mason jar contraptions, like the sippy cup lid with the giant straw. And I just found it in my drawer today and I was like, that is how I'm drinking my Fernandez's sangria tonight. So check out this rig. I'm just drinking it old school redneck style right out of the jar. To all of the nurses on International Nurses Day, cheers to you guys. Cheers to the fighter pilots that did the flyovers today, and cheers to the 85th um, recruiting troop from the Massachusetts State Police, all 240 of you that graduated today. Congratulations to you guys, and cheers to you from the war room. Will says, you are going to be hung over tomorrow. Hold on. You guys said I was going to be hung over today after the margaritas last night. First of all, I got the best night's sleep I've gotten in over a week last night. I woke up early this morning. I did a bunch of work around the house. I was cleaning kitchen drawers today. I felt like a million bucks. I'm good. Now tomorrow, after drinking a mason jar of Fernandez's sangria in a straw, maybe. We'll just have to wait and see. It's like we're doing science around here. Don't say redneck. Did you watch Ozark? I have not watched Ozark yet, so don't spoil it for me. It's on my list of things to do. Salud. MC busts in like a rock star, Eric says. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, tomorrow night, the flower moon is going to be there. It's the last super moon of the year, so these guys are supposed to be clear tomorrow night, so you'll have something to do with the kids. You can go out and check out the giant moon tomorrow night. Um, let me see. Guns N' Roses announced they are releasing a children's picture book. You can't make this up. I have no idea how they're going to make Guns N' Roses palatable for children, but they are going to figure it out. Professional Sangria Test Pilot. That's exactly right. Blueberry Tequila Shots. Uh, the Narco. <gasps> oh my God, who said that? Tracy. You're the bomb. Sangria and Cheez-Its. Yeah, I told you guys I was going to ruin Cheez-Its for you guys too. Never go for the Cheez-It, man. I'm telling you, that's good life advice. Paula says, I had a hangover from hell today. Tequila, no bueno. I think it's um, how much sugar is in the margarita mix. And also, you got to drink the good tequila. You can't go for the, the shitty stuff. You got to. That's one of the life lessons as you get older is you realize that there are certain things Correct me if I'm wrong, this is a theory of mine. As you get older, you realize there are certain things that you do not cheap out on. I will give you a short list. Socks, 
Mattresses, sheets, alcohol. You always buy the good stuff, even though it's more expensive from those things, in my opinion. You always buy a good mattress, always buy good sheets. You always get the good socks. I sound like an infantry guy talking about his freaking socks. And then you always get the good booze. So there you go. Actually, if I sounded like a real grunt, I would tell you to change your socks and take Motrin. But I'm not a real grunt, so I'll just talk about how you got to have the good socks. Where is Wednesday? I brought the official Wednesday caller, Christina, to see if I could get her in here. I brought the fucking Stingray in here. Wednesday! You want to come play with the Stingray? Come here! Let's see if she comes. She was out in the yard a lot today because I got a lot of stuff done. I planted some flowers and stuff today. So I don't know if she wants to get up right now. Sorry if I'm making your dogs go crazy. Colleen says, have you seen Narcos on Netflix? No, that's on my list too. We got the hiccups. <laughs> Wednesday. She's not moving yet. I'll put the stingray back there. Maybe we could get her. Uh, and sneakers and running shoes. And definitely coffee, says Danielle. Um... Rick says, and ketchup, not catsup. Lou, get good toilet paper. Okay. Spend top dollar on top shelf. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, do not cheap out on toilet paper. I, I agree. Military answer for everything. Drink more water, says Eric. Yeah, that drink more water, change your socks, Motrin. Uh, Tina says, buy good underwear. That's true. That's definitely true. Um, oh, yeah, I know. Goodbye pillows. Actually, pillows, I guess that kind of goes with sheets and the mattress. Like, you want to have good pillows, too. I planted my first rose bush today. Happy Mother's Day, uh, says Madeline. Yeah, th th we're getting to that point where we can start planting stuff. What happened to the flamingo, David said. She's got the flamingo, too, um, but the squeaker is broken in the flamingo because she ate it because she's a vicious flamingo hunter. But the stingray survives. The flamingo is still in one piece. She hasn't gotten the stuffing out of it yet. But for some reason, she comes when I squeeze the stingray. So, uh, yeah, good underwear. A lot of people are agreeing. Um, Ray says, Jesus Christ, my greyhound just flew down the stairs. I told you I'm sorry. I squeezed the stingray and freaked everything out. Monica says, spend money on good paper towels. David says, uh, jewelry. And Jesse says, spend good money on shampoo, which is good, especially if you dye your hair. You don't want to get the cheap shit. You want to take care of your dye job. Hair dye, says Jesse, exactly, especially when you got to do that shit at home because you can't go see Linda, your hair guru, because there's a global pandemic. Jesse says, no underwear is better. There you go. Um, uh, uh, did you guys hear about what's going on in the UK? 5G protesters, conspiracy theorists, have burned down 77 5G towers in the UK because the conspiracy theory is that it's somehow tied to the virus. 77. Crazy. Uh, Leo says he's 47 today. Leo, I got birthdays for you. So first of all, happy birthday to Leo. And you share your birthday with Meek Mill, BFFs with Robert Kraft, uh, Chris Shiflett from the Foo Fighters, and Bob freaking Seeger. It's his birthday today, too. So, Leo, you're in good company. Congratulations and happy birthday. Eric, you're totally right. You don't cheap out on ammunition. If you're going to buy ammo, buy the good stuff. One of my Afghanistan guys, when he got home, he went to the range and he had cheap ammo and it blew his gun apart. Could have been very bad. He sent me pictures of this brand new gun that he bought and it was just, it blew the barrel apart. It looked like Yosemite Sam shit. It was really bad. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Andrea says, LOL at 5G. Bob Seeger's birthday today. That's what I just said. Happy birthday, Leo. Getting a lot of birthday love there. Um, 
So one of the wicked smart people in Massachusetts, um, the corona antibody test that was developed in Boston, they are saying is 1,000 times more sensitive than all of the other antibody tests that are out there. So to the smart mass holes that are doing good science, cheers to you guys while we're all sitting here getting drunk in the war room. Scott says, I'm going to miss this when it's over. Well, Scott, it might never end. Actually, I mean, at some point when we're all allowed to go outside, it'll end every night. But I think I've made the decision that we're going to have to have cocktails in the war room like forever. We just might not be able to do it every night. But I don't think it's something I'm willing to let go of um, once things go kind of back to normal. So my goal is to continue cocktails in the war room. I just don't know what kind of schedule or with what kind of frequency. But um, I think that we should continue to do it in some way, shape, or form because I kind of love it. I love hanging out with you guys. I love answering your questions. Um, does the fruit fit up that straw? Uh, some of it does. The rest of it's just kind of floating in there. Can you see it? Um, so I, I haven't quite figured it out yet. I mean, obviously... There are a lot of things about my future and the future of my career that are dependent on um, how we recover from the virus, obviously, how the entertainment business recovers from the virus. And then depending on what my next career move is, that's going to determine um, what my availability will be. Um, I would like to think that doing it nightly is going to be impossible because I would like to kind of get back to my life of at least working and going to concerts, which would be totally cool. But uh, there's no way that we are ever going to have a last cocktails in the war room. Um, we are going to continue it. I just don't know how we're going to do it yet. But, um, you know, maybe we'll do it once a week or every once in a while and I'll promote it ahead of time so you don't miss it. But um, I can't just say, okay, yeah, once this is over, we're never going to do this again because I love hanging out with you guys. I just think it's so fun. Um, there are a lot of things that I've been working on and things that I've been doing. You know, when I, there are a lot of things that I wish that I had time for when I was still at AAF and a lot of people have said, you know, why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? Or why didn't you do these Facebook live videos before? And the reason was, um, you know, I was really busy, especially the last couple of years between moving studios and moving a lot of things around and then Hillman moving. And then when we decided to rebuild AAF, getting ready to relaunch it, obviously, before we found out that the signal was getting sold, um, I was the assistant program director. So I was working like 18 hours a day. I was at work constantly. So I didn't have the time to be able to dedicate to all of these other extracurricular things. But now that I've been able to slow my life down a little bit, um, it's really kind of shown me that there are a lot of things that I want to do and things that I wish that I had done sooner. And so while the rest of the world is kind of slowing down a little bit, I'm trying to move faster to try and catch up to where I wish that I had been had I had copious amounts of free time while I was helping to run WAF all those years. So, um, but one of the things that I see in the future is us continuing to meet like this because um, I just love it. I love the fact that, you know, we can have, albeit a one-way conversation, but you guys can comment right back. It's like, it's like the text line we had in the studio, but faster. Um, so we're going to continue cocktails in the war room after the lockdown or the, social distancing or the quarantining is over, um, just stay tuned for more info. I mean, I'm hoping that I get a real job or, you know, figure out what it is that I'm going to do next. And then once we do that, then we'll figure it out. Um, yes, it is very eye opening to have a little bit of, um, um, downtime. Um, somebody just asked why, uh, the WAF's frequency got sold. You would have to ask the CEO and the, you know, the, the people behind the company. Um, I have my theories. And, um, you know, obviously it was a financial decision. Uh, the signal got sold for ten and a half million dollars, um, which in my mind is a steal. 
Um, I've been buying Powerball tickets, trying to see if I could win enough money to try and buy it back, but that hasn't happened yet, so my plan is not working. Um, in my opinion, I think it was a bad business decision. I think that a 50-year legacy rock station is not something that, um, you know, you get rid of. Although I know that, you know, the station had kind of been on a roller coaster for the last few years. But I also am a firm believer, and this sounds like a business rationalization. It sounds like someone that's trying to say that, you know, our ratings weren't good. And I'm trying to say ratings don't matter because ratings do matter. The salespeople need some tangible thing to be able to prove that people actually listen to your radio station. But I don't believe that rock radio has ever been accurately measured or represented in the ratings. Um, I think it, it's an industry and a genre issue. I think that there are a lot of badass rock fans. I think there are a ton of AAF listeners that could not participate in the programs that would um, measure your you listening, the ratings. Um, there's a lot of people that are in uniform that can't wear the little sensor, the little people meter, that that's how they measure it. Um, there's a lot of people that were in, work in secure locations, whether they be on military bases or in correctional facilities or whatever, where they're not allowed. Or, or maybe you're uh, wearing an OSHA harness at work if you're an iron worker or you're climbing cell phone towers and you can't wear these little machines that they want you to measure the ratings. That doesn't mean you're not listening. It just means that that part of the population can't take part in how they generate the ratings. And all of the people that I just mentioned are all rock guys and they can't be part of it. So um, I think that the company needed the money. I think that the station had taken its bruises from bad management a few years ago to obviously losing our morning show. And let's face it, there were some years where there wasn't a lot of great new rock coming out and that kind of hurt us as well, although I don't think that's the case anymore. There were a lot of reasons. It just breaks my heart that um, you know, there wasn't a way for the company to come up with the $10.5 million somewhere else because I feel in my soul that had we been able to launch the radio station that we built, um, I think you guys would have loved it. And I think that had we launched it, and um, on March 2nd, the way that we had planned, that I think by the fall, especially through the coronavirus and all of that craziness, that our ratings would have gone up where the company would have been like, oh, okay, leave them alone. I mean, we're never gonna be, you know, like a sports station. We're never gonna be like a top 40 station that has all of these people listening. But you guys know, you're part of the crew. Rock fans are a close-knit, loyal bunch of junkyard dogs, and we stick together. And I just don't think that there's a way that big corporate companies can measure that kind of loyalty and passion that we all have. And I consider myself one of those AAF fans too because I grew up listening to the station. And, um, you know, I miss it. I get in the car now and I'm like, shit, what am I supposed to listen to? It drives me crazy. So, I mean, I don't know why that decision got made. It's, as they say in the military, way above my pay grade. Um, I can just tell you that the decision still stings and I'm still heartbroken over it. Um, however, I'm trying to see this terrible situation as an opportunity. I feel like the baby bird that got kicked out of the nest because that was my nest since I was 18 years old in one way, shape, or form. And so now I'm trying to figure out what it is that I'm also capable of. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities and I'm trying to figure out how I fit into um, this new world, especially right now with everything that's going on with the virus. When the world rebounds and we start you know, opening up the country again, um, there are gonna be a lot of things that change. For example, if you are working from home now and you never did before. I think there are gonna be a lot of companies that lease tons of expensive office space that are going to realize that maybe they don't need to spend so much money on office space and that they could start having their employees on a rotating work from home schedule. They'll probably realize that their employees will get more work done in some cases because they're gaining time in their day to not be commuting. Um, 
they'll be able to use less square footage of work, less resources. And I think there's a lot of companies that are seeing their productivity stay the same, even though almost all of their employees are working from home. Uh, I think there are going to be a lot of radio stations that start having people working from home more and more all the time because they're all doing it right now. Almost every show and every person um, that's on the radio right now that's live, uh, which is becoming less and less, um, they're doing it from home. And so I think the world is really going to change. Obviously, there are people that are always going to have to go to work. If you're a nurse or a firefighter or a police officer, you have to leave the house to go to work. I hate to tell you. But there are a lot of people that work in, um, you know, any kind of computer field, any kind, you know, human resource. There could be companies that just say, you know what, Monday through Wednesday, you work from home. Thursday and Friday, you're mandatory to be in the office so that we can have all the meetings we need to have and keep everybody on task and focused and whatever. But it's going to be... Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how the world reacts. And I'm very curious to see how radio, how communications and how the music businesses all kind of go back to normal because they're all going to go back differently. And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to figure out right now is how I fit into all of that. So, um, I'm trying to see the positive of it. Instead of focusing on the dream job that I had for all of those years, I'm trying to kind of take the blinders off and see all of the other things that I have as opportunities now. And, um, you know, it's changed a lot. Technology's opened up avenues that I could go in that just didn't even exist when I started. So um, we'll see. You know, Mark says Sirius XM is the model. Well, it is and it isn't, Mark. Uh, Sirius and XM are starting to focus more and more on their app and on their streaming. But there was a long time where their business model was extremely expensive, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of satellites. That is not a good business model. But as everyone starts focusing more on the internet, uh, especially if protesters don't burn down all of the 5G towers, there's going to be a lot of different opportunity. And so I'm just trying to figure out where my place is and all of that. Um, until then, I'm here in the war room with you guys every night. So that's a good sign. And I'm drinking sangria out of a mason jar. But I showered today and I'm wearing pants. So I haven't completely gone off the rails. Um, what else did I want to talk to you guys about? Oh, uh, the Animal Rescue League of Boston says that there has been an uptick in people abandoning their pets outside of shelters. Guinea pigs, a cat, a dog. This is what I was worried about when people started adopting all of these animals because of the shutdown and people spending all this time at home. First of all, if you have been financially affected and you can no longer financially take care of your pet, please don't abandon them outside of an animal shelter. Um, you can go inside and surrender your animal safely and they'll take your animal from you. There are a lot of shelters that are empty right now because all of their animals have been adopted. So if you have an animal that you just cannot take care of, don't abandon your animals outside. It puts your animal at risk. It's dangerous for them. Bring them inside. Tell the people at the shelter that you can't take care of them. Bring the medical records. Like surrender your animal in a in a humane way and they'll get the animal adopted back out. The people that work at the Animal Rescue League or the MSPCA, they're amazing people and they want what's best for your animal. So just please just don't abandon your animals like that. You could take them inside. You're, they're not going to get arrested. You will get arrested for endangering your animal and leaving them outside to die in the cold or starve or whatever. Then you're just being an asshole. But if you bring your animal inside and say, look, I lost my job. I can't afford to take care of them anymore. That's what shelters are there for. So just do it responsibly. But um, it just broke my heart to read that article. So... Um, just please, you know, if you know of someone that is having a really hard financial time and they're worried about their animals, just, you know, just please, if you hear about anybody that's thinking about doing that or also keep your eyes out for abandoned animals, especially in the vicinity of animal shelters. Um, there are people that literally just tie dogs up to the fence and walk away. 
And if the shelter's already closed, you know, the dog might not get found until the next day. It, 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 it's just, I can't even think about it because it breaks my heart. So just please, 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 please be responsible and surrender your animals responsibly. Um, is the, Eric says, is this a no Wednesday Wednesday? What the fuck? Look, I'm trying to get her over here. But she doesn't want to come. I don't know where she is. Wednesday! Come here! Look, if she doesn't want to come over, there's nothing I could do. She's like her mother. She's bullheaded. Stubborn. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, I just touched my face. Oh, my God! Uh, May 18th here in the Commonwealth. The Massachusetts Reopening Board report is due, and that is the report that is going to have all of the recommendations on the reopening progress and strategy for Massachusetts. So we got a couple weeks, and then we're supposed to get the report. What it's going to say in there, who the hell knows. Um, sad news for music fans, the co-founder of Kraftwerk, uh, Florian Schneider, has passed away at the age of 73 from cancer. Um, I believe nominated again for induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I could be mistaken, but I believe that's true. Uh, and then just to go through all of the numbers with you real quick before I show you the War Room Artifact of the Night, uh, Massachusetts cases, 72,025. That is up 1,754 from yesterday. There have been 4,420 fatalities. That is up 208 from yesterday. There are currently 922 patients in the ICU that are being treated for the coronavirus. They have done 339,639 tests thus far. That is up 6,290 from yesterday. 28% of the tests that have been done in Massachusetts have tested positive. And of the 72,025 cases that have been confirmed, 5% of those cases have required hospitalization. So that just kind of gives you some of the percentages so you have a better idea of, um, you know, if they've done almost 340,000 tests and 28% of those are coming up positive, and then 5% of that 28% require hospitalization, it just um, kind of gives you a, uh, a better idea as to what's going on. That's Massachusetts. Nationally, we are up to over 1.25 million cases. That is up 22,204 from yesterday. There have been 73,667 fatalities, and that is up 2,457 from yesterday. So those are all of the numbers when it comes to um, the coronavirus. Okay, so what I wanted to show you guys tonight, it's just a little tchotchke. It's not anything crazy. But um, I wanted to show you, I showed you the helmet that uh, I had with my body armor. But one of the things that um, you'll see um, soldiers wear uh, on their uniforms are their name tapes. And um, we obviously weren't in uniform, but the, the body armor vests that we were wearing were not issued to us by the military, but they were military um, grade and we got them from a military supplier and on there there was a velcro strip on our body armor so uh oh producer mike just chimed in um so what i wanted to show you is me and producer mike's name tapes from afghanistan um we had them made so that we could have um normally it's you know the last name of the soldier but we had these made instead and um Mike gave me one of his. I believe I gave him one of mine, and I keep him on the shelf in the war room as like a little, you know, just a little token and a little memory. Um, I have some military bags that the guys gave me as well, and so I have some more of these, and I have them because um, Mistress Carrie didn't really fit. You only get so many characters, so we put uh, Mike on there. And... Um, I don't know, I just like having them. So I have some different military bags, like I have a military computer bag and some other stuff that has the Velcro strip. So I have a bunch of these and I put them on all of my stuff. And uh, I don't know, they just make me smile. They crack me up. So Mike, I still have yours and I have it in the war room on the shelf. All right. 
Let's find ourselves a drink recipe tonight, shall we? Now that you've recovered from all of your margaritas. Okay, this is a good one. Uh, this, of course, coming out of the uh, New American Bartender's Handbook. Uh, this is called the Horse's Neck. And this is two ounces of bourbon. Uh, I, you know I am not a fan of the bourbon, but it's two ounces of bourbon. Two dashes of Angostura bitters, ginger ale, and a twist of lemon. So if you're a bourbon person, this sounds like a good summer drink. Coat a highball glass with bitters, add ice and the bourbon, and stir, and then fill with ginger ale and a lemon twist. Stir briefly and serve, and that is called a horse's neck, um, which I think is pretty cool. Michelle says, bring Mike on some night. So here's the thing. Right now, because of the social distancing, I can't have any guests with me in the war room. And as I've explained in previous episodes, the way that Facebook is on these pages, not a profile like a regular Facebook profile, but on a page that you like instead of add the friend, um, I can't bring anybody live in with me, which is why when I talked to Mike Shu and Stiz, I did it on Instagram live instead. However, once the uh, stay-at-home orders are lifted or whatever they want to call them, and I can have people come over, that's one of the reasons why I want to continue cocktails in the war room once the world goes back to normal, because then I can bring people in the war room with me and we can tell stories together. Because there are a lot of people that I've been telling stories about that... Um, you need to hear their side of the story as well. So that is totally my plan is to be able to continue cocktails in the war room in some way, shape or form and to bring these people in here. And trust me, I can't wait for you guys to meet Mike because somehow in this odd couple dynamic duo, I sometimes a lot more than normal am the normal one which doesn't even make sense. Mike's the guy that you look at him and he just looks like a respectable person, like a dad, just like a regular nice guy. And then you peel him like an onion and you get a couple layers in and you realize he's twisted as fuck. And Mike, I say that with all the love in the world because you know it's the twisty parts of you that I love the most. But me, I look twisty on the outside. But when Mike and I are together, shit gets weird fast. And if Mike and I are together with all of the guys we were with overseas, it's a whole other level of foobar. So it, uh, it is definitely, yes, he will tell you the blueberry cobbler story from his side for sure. But that is one of my goals is to be able to continue cocktails in the war room, but to be able to bring a lot of the people you've heard. Like, I can't wait to introduce you to some of the people that you've heard me tell stories about because you're going to be like, oh my God, that's the guy. That's the guy. Exactly. Speaking of these stories, I have another story for you before I get out of here. While I'm still drinking Fernandez's sangria out of a mason jar. So today, SportsCenter tweeted out a video of James Harrison. Former Pittsburgh Steeler, former New England Patriot, um, James Harrison. Who, by the way, is 42 years old. We were talking the other day about the mountain and how he deadlifted 1140 pounds. Well, I guess not to be outdone, James Harrison put a video up online. Sports Center tweeted it out. Go and find it. I want to hear your reaction um, or see your reaction in the comments. You know those sleds that, you know, they, they push them and they're loaded up with weights that they use them to train their mighty quads and their ass muscles for football? James Harrison, at age 42, pushed 1,960 pounds in a sled. He looks bigger now than he did when he was playing. I say that because I met him while he was playing, and he was a big dude. But he looks bigger now, and I don't know if he's starting to train for a comeback like Mike Tyson is, because Mike Tyson's in his 50s, and he's in the gym, and he wants to come back and start boxing again. But James Harrison is a beast. Scott said the same thing. He's a beast, especially for his age. Fuck for his age. I don't know guys half his age that can push 960 pounds with their mighty quads. Except for my buddy Medeiros, who says his quads are so mighty they can't be sheathed by denim, because he's got big quads. 
anyway. Is that what they call it, the bobsled? Yeah, okay, so he pushed the bobsled. So here's my James Harrison story, and then I'll let you guys go. I told this story on the air already, but I believe that the person that this story about is actually watching. Names have been changed to protect the innocent. So a couple of years ago, this was 2018. Um, every year, the week between the AFC and NFC Championship game and the Super Bowl, the off week of football season, um, Gillette Stadium hosts the Blue Cord Ball, which is the Massachusetts Army National Guard's infantry ball. And it is a joint ball for the 181st, uh, keep your powder dry, and the 182nd, we uphold our ancient honors, infantry of the Mass Army National Guard. And because I was embedded with the 182nd Infantry in Afghanistan, I go to the ball every year and it is a blast and it's a big formal event and all the guys got their blues on and they have it at Gillette Stadium and it's awesome. And then all of the soldiers, if you've ever been bar hopping at Patriot Place in the middle of January or, or towards the end of January and wondered why all of a sudden there were thousands of soldiers cramming themselves into all of the bars, it's because the Blue Cord Ball was at Gillette Stadium. So I had invited um, a friend of mine who is a Marine to come to the ball. And he's in the infantry in the Marine Corps. So he's coming to the infantry ball with all my army friends and whatever. And we went to the ball. Everybody's all dressed up. And then we all went bar hopping and we closed all of the bars at Gillette. And then to be responsible, Everybody that I know stays in the hotels at the stadium so that nobody's drinking and driving. So we pile out of the arena, the stadium into all the bars and then everybody just makes the walks back to the hotel and then we all hang out at the hotel and whatever. And sometimes it's the only time of the year I get to see a lot of the guys that I met overseas. So we're piling into the elevator in one of the hotels and we cram in the elevator and just as the elevator doors are closing one of the guys that we were with goes that's james harrison and everybody that was in the elevator with me looked over and james harrison was sitting in the elevator in a gray hoodie with his hands in his pockets like in a sweatsuit this is 2 30 in the morning now what had happened was the patriots had won the afc championship and we had gotten James Harrison from the Steelers and he came from Pittsburgh and didn't have a place to live. So he was living at the hotel at Gillette Stadium. That's where he was staying. So we're all half in the wrapper and everybody in the elevators got dress uniforms on but me and I got a gown on and it's 2.30 in the morning and we're drunk and there's James Harrison and my friend was like, never heard of him. And I was like, well, we stole him from the Steelers and he's going to help us win the Super Bowl. And I said, it's really nice to meet you. Good luck next week. We're, you know, we love you guys, huge fans, blah, 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 whatever. So my friend standing next to James Harrison in his dress blues leaned at a socially awkward distance and said, and introduced himself, name, rank, and serial number kind of way and says, I only got two things to say to you. Now he's saying this to James Harrison. One, we're both Americans. And I'm like this, oh fuck. My drunk friend is about to embarrass me and everyone else in the elevator in front of James Harrison. This is gonna suck. And then he says, and two, please stand for the anthem. And James Harrison said, I always stand for the anthem. And then my friend shook his hand thanked him very much, wished him luck. And then as the elevator doors opened on James Harrison's floor, bypassing the floor the rest of us were supposed to get out of the elevator on, we were just like, I guess we're not leaving because this guy's in the middle of having a conversation with James Harrison. As James Harrison's trying to get out of the elevator, my friend hands me the phone and says, will you take a picture for me? So there I am taking a picture of my friend and James Harrison actually was the most gracious, lovely, wonderful guy, took the pictures, and then I was like, well, if I gotta take a picture, now I'm taking a selfie, and I have a selfie with James Harrison making this awkward face. I was like, 
because I was making the face because my friend was like keeping James Harrison from getting off of the elevator. I was like, really? Then he got off the elevator and we wished him luck and said it was nice to meet him. And then we left. And ever since then, that's been a joke. So today I'm on Twitter. I see the Sports Center post about James Harrison and his giant 42 year old man quads pushing the bobsled with 1,960 pounds on it. And I texted the video to my friend and said, Remember the time you got in his face in the elevator at Gillette Stadium and told him that you were both Americans and to stand for the anthem? And my, and my friend texted me back and was like, oh yeah. And he always stands for the anthem and I got the picture to prove it. So that just shows you the kind of weirdos that I hang out with from time to time. So enough with James Harrison. I can't help it, dude. Look at the video. He's a beast. Anyway, it was a funny story. And it, he was really, really gracious to everybody that was annoying him in the elevator at 2.30 in the morning, which I'm sure was not exactly what he wanted to be doing at that hour, was dealing with all of us. But he was really nice anyway. So there's my James Harrison story. But go and watch the video. It's insane. A human being shouldn't be able to move that much weight. It's unbelievable. So there you go. All right, guys. I think it's time for me to get out of here. Tomorrow, don't forget the flower moon. It's the last super moon of the year and you'll have clear skies to be at the jug, I know. Um, you know what's great? Is that you can measure exactly how much you've been drinking. You can do math. Um, the last super moon of the year tomorrow night, so get the kids outside with a telescope and binoculars and check the whole thing out. Jeff says, I love your stories. I've got some gems. Um, and it's never me. It's always the crazy people I'm with. You'll notice this trend after a while. Does it taste better in a mason jar? It doesn't. It could use a little ice just because there's so much of it. It kind of needs to be cool. But I thought this little sippy cup straw contraption thing, I'm kind of digging it. I can't remember which one of my crazy family members gave it to me for Christmas, but I am totally into it. Um... Gerard says, your friend is a badass Marine though, so of course he will have no problem getting in anyone's face. True, but he's a badass Marine, but I'm pretty sure James Harrison could have snapped him like a twig, especially after seeing that video of him moving 1,960 pounds with his legs. Beast. All right, guys. I love you guys. Stay safe tonight. Stay healthy. Thank you to all of the nurses on International Nurses Day. You guys are our heroes. Thank you for everything that you do. Thanks to the F-15 pilots for the tribute today. It was absolutely awesome. Congratulations to the 85th recruiting troop from the Mass State Police who are now on duty on the road. So don't drive like assholes because those new guys are out there looking to write some tickets. And um, for everybody else, thank you to all of the essential workers, all of the first responders, all of the healthcare workers, all our military personnel who are doing amazing work. Thank you to everybody that is staying out of their way and staying home and social distancing. I know it sucks. I know it's hard with the kids. Um, and especially people that are stuck spending way too much time alone. You always have us. We'll always be here in the war room at 830 for you. So you are not alone and you always have friends here. So thank you guys for joining me every night. Stay safe. Stay strong. Stay healthy. I love you. I'll see you tomorrow.